Hello, hello, hello. I'm Nathan Lively from Sound Design Live, and this is flexible sound system calibration with Crosslight. Um, so if you're wondering why I have a hat on in my jacket, it's because I'm in a warehouse here at Valley Self-Defense in Stillwater, Minnesota. Um, and it is 32 degrees Fahrenheit outside, uh, and that's easy to convert. 32 degrees should be zero degrees Celsius, right? So pretty cold. And uh, I want to thank Valley Self-Defense for letting me use their warehouse, though. And if you guys are in the Minneapolis or central Minnesota area, I definitely recommend you check out Valley Self-Defense. They put on some really great self-defense uh, workshops. Um, it seems like every couple of months they're doing some really interesting new workshop. So thank you for them. Um, I would love to know if this is all working because I'm just staring into a computer. So if you can see me and hear me and see my slides, I would love it if you would type yes into the chat. Cool. So it also looks like we have about a 20 to 30 second delay. That's fine. Um, I'd like to know who's with us here today. So if you could please type your name and where you are in the world today in the chat, that'd be really interesting for me. So I'm Nathan and I'm currently in Stillwater, Minnesota. Okay, so Tyson is in Fort McMurray, Alberta, Canada. Hi, Tyson. Keith is in New York. Hi, Keith. Deary is in Lower Normandy, France. Hi, Deary. And Zolt is in Hungary. Uh, Hovani is in the Netherlands. Welcome, you guys. Dan is in Michigan, I'm, I'm assuming, not M Mahegan. And Casper is in Poland. That's cool. And Daniel from Belgium. Welcome, you guys. Matthias is in a bar. <laughs> oh, wow, someone all the way from India. It must be late there. OK. Well, thank you guys from jo for joining us. Um, this is something I've been looking forward to doing for a while. I've actually been using Crosslight for a couple of years now and have been wanting to do something about it uh, to sort of show you what my life is like now. So let's get into it a little bit. Let me switch over to the right controls. So this is what my life is like these days. Uh, when I go to work on a show, um, well, let's say, I, let me tell you how it used to be before. So a year ago, still, I would show up, I would set up the sound system, and then when it came time to do my calibration work, I would usually deploy like five or six microphones, as many as I could get my hands on, right? And then they would pretty much stay there for most of the work. And that's how I would get lots of data and do averages and things like that. And uh, I guess I would be playing you know, pink noise into the room for anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour, as long as I could get, right? as long as we have for sound system setup. Um, how my workflow has changed in a big way over the last year is that now, when I go out into the field, I have one microphone. And I just move that microphone from place to place, and I'm playing pink noise into the room for you know anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes. And once I've captured all my data, then I go back, sit down in front of the computer, and I'm able to do all of my work after that, basically offline in silence. And people like that a lot, right? 
Uh, they don't really know what I'm doing back there, but they know that it's quiet and they appreciate that. And that's what I am here to talk to you guys about today. Um, and I just want to make it really clear that today's presentation is not at all about which audio analyzer is better, right? That's a pretty surface level, you know, uh, le very uninteresting conversation. What is really interesting is what sort of interesting, flexible workflows do we have access to with these different tools, right? So let, we're going to be looking specifically at Crosslight today and how it gives us access to some uh, specific workflows and opportunities um, that I honestly haven't found with any other tools that I've encountered yet. And I just appreciate how they are packaged together. Um, so thank you guys for being here. I know there's a lot you could be doing with your time right now, and I really appreciate that you have decided to spend some of your time here with me. I always need to thank some of the teachers that came before me, and I really appreciate everyone that's helped me out along the way. Um, so hopefully you guys know me already, or you probably wouldn't be here, but I'm Nathan Lively. I have a podcast, a YouTube channel, uh, and I'm also the founder of Tracebook and Subaligner. And I'm also the creator of a new workshop that I'm putting together called Crosslight Modern Calibration Workflow. And I'm going to be talking about that at the end of today for just about five minutes. So this entire thing today, it's all completely free. And the recording will be available to you to watch in the future if you would like. And uh, the trade-off for that is that then I do about a five-minute commercial at the end where I try to pitch you on joining something new that I'm putting together. So please um, remove anything that's going to distract you. You know, hopefully get something you can use to take notes. If you've never seen Crosslight before, then a lot of this is going to be new to you. And that's OK. You know, this is really more about opening up your eyes to some of the new possibilities and opportunities that are out there. And also, you should enter the giveaway. What is the giveaway? Well, uh, I talked Francisco Montaidu, the creator of Crosslight, into giving away one license to a free copy of Crosslight. And so I'm going to put that link into the chat right now. Because if you haven't entered, you still have time to do that. You can enter right now. So I'm putting that into the chat. And for those of you who are watching on Facebook, I don't have the Facebook chat in front of me right now, unfortunately. Um, and I'm on a very low bandwidth uh, setting here just in this warehouse. Um, but you can find the giveaway link on my Facebook page. So if you're watching this, then you know Sound Design Live. So just go to the Sound Design Live Facebook page. And if you scroll down through the post there, you'll see the link to the giveaway. Or I think it's also in the discussion uh, page, the discussion section for this event. So sorry to make you jump through a couple of hoops there. But please enter that giveaway, because if you stick around to the end, I'm going to draw the names for that giveaway. Well, it's just one person. But I may have to draw more than once, because you must be present to win. So I'm going to draw a name. And if it's Jeff, and Jeff is here already from San Jose, then he's going to immediately win. Um, but if Jeff's not here and he doesn't claim his prize, then I'm just going to keep drawing until I find someone who's actually present. And then uh, we'll give away a free copy of Crosslight. So $500 value, pretty cool. Okay. So here's what we're going to do today. Um, it's just a bunch of fun live demonstrations. We're going to look at how you can do subalignment backwards. What does that mean? We're going to look at removing reflections from a noisy room like this one, uh, how we can employ some uh, optimization routines, uh, some auto solver uh, tools that we have in Crosslight to help with this, how we can create compensation files for our RF mics and why we might want to do that, how we can take a bunch of measurements and do some fast EQ, and then how we can quickly find maybe some feedback frequencies with the 3D spectrograph. Um, and then at the very end, after we do all that, I will pitch you guys on this new workshop that I've been working on. 
uh, and then we'll take any questions that are left. So let's get into that. But first, what is Crosslight? I I've, I've keep saying this word, Crosslight, and if you've never seen it uh, or heard of it before, then it doesn't make any sense to you. Well, when we have an audio analyzer that we use to do our calibration work on sound systems in the field as sound engineers, that audio analyzer uh, typically has three parts. It has a microphone, an audio interface, um, and then the software that runs on your computer. And Crosslight is one of those pieces of software. You may be familiar with other names like Smart from Rational Acoustics, SatLive, Open Sound Meter, um, FIR Capture, which I, I'm not sure if is around anymore, Arda, Rumi Q Wizard, uh, System I. There's a, there's a bunch of them out there. And this is one of them. Uh, and this audio analyzer is created by Francisco Mantairu. And he was kind enough to co host today's event. And so I'm going to bring on Francisco for just a little bit. Um, now, he's not at his studio. He's actually on the road in between two places. And so you're going to hear a little bit of background noise um, where he's at. But um, Francisco, I wanted to bring you on and first of all, just say hello and welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you to be here, Nathan. Um, so, Francisco, I would love it if you would talk for just a, um, just a minute about the origin of Crosslight. Why did you create it? Um, what was sort of your motivation for starting it? Yes, I am an electronic engineer and work basically developing loudspeaker, power amplifiers, uh, active loudspeaker, full processor, and then in R and D, it's really normal to develop uh, our own software to a specific measurement because uh, we have always a special uh, needs. Okay, inside R and D. So twelve years ago, I start to step by step create my tools, and then uh, just to don't prolong my. <laughs> my my speech here uh in the beginning of pandemic i decided to transform all these softwares that i use inside rnd in a tool for everyone because uh, uh, i don't when, with pandemic everything stopped it in, here in brazil all events uh, use maybe you have the same and uh, the same situation so I decide to do something to, of course, to make money uh, uh, or trying to reach the work. Okay. So I transform my software and a software to everyone. Basically, this is the, the reason. Yeah, that's great. And, and I, for one, am really glad that you did that. Um, if you had just kept this as a tool for yourself, in the laboratory, then I would never get to use it. And, uh, uh, you know, us and the people, the, the small group, the community that has come up around Crosslight would never get to use it. So um, thank you again for being here. Thank you for telling us a little bit about your story. And um, I think, uh, I think Francisco is going to stick around for a little while. So if anyone has specific questions for Francisco or about Crosslight, I think he's gonna be here for a little while, and so you'll be able to ask him. Um, okay, well, in that case, I'm going to take you out, Francisco, and we're gonna move along. But Francisco, just message me if you wanna come back for any reason, um, or you see any questions that I have skipped. Okay. So let's actually get into the fun stuff. Let me just reorganize the screen a little bit. And let me make sure that you are seeing what I am seeing. Great. So what do I mean by subalignment backwards? Well, what I mean is that um, we, when we go to do some kind of crossover alignment, the method that we are used to doing is you always have to start with the full range source because that's how you set your time reference, the delay locator, the delay compensation, whatever it's called in your audio analyzer. 
That's how it's set. Because the audio analyzer looks for a peak of energy, and then it goes like, boom, OK, here's where the reference is. And then it does all its work after that in terms of um, showing you the data and doing any kind of windowing or noise reduction that it needs to do. So let's just go ahead and do that here. Let me make sure that my microphone is still on over there. It looks like the battery is maybe about to die. Um, so we start by measuring our full range source. So I'll just do that here. And then I'll switch over to my sub, and I need to move one cable here. Okay, and I messed up the names here. Let me fix this. My fingers are so cold, it's hard to type. Okay, so you would typically start with your full range source, you set the delay locator, and then you measure your subwoofer, and you don't change the delay locator after you set it with your full range source because you need that high frequency energy, that peak in the impulse response that you see here to set that delay locator. And so then you would come over here and you would switch over to your phase graph or whatever your process is for doing your alignment. So that all works out well and good. And you can do that process in Crosslight just like that. Where you might run into a problem is if the automatic setting of the delay locator doesn't work correctly. So where that can happen and where it's happened to me a lot in the field is um, the delay locator accidentally catches on to a reflection. And the reflection is actually arriving later, but it's possible for the reflection to arrive with more energy than the direct sound. And that's what I'm going to try and demonstrate for you right now. So let me make sure I have enough cable to actually get over here. And I'm going to move my microphone into such a way that I can try and create a problem. I'm going to try and get it close enough to the ground that it'll actually pick up the reflection from the ground. And I know I'm sort of creating an artificial problem, but it has happened to me several times in the field where um, the reflection is just right so that it is higher in peak or just for a moment, like momentarily, it'll be higher in peak than uh, the direct sound and then the it'll get locked onto. So, Let's get rid of this. And so um, I still have it set up so that the delay locator will be set automatically. I just need to get the right source going here, move this cable. So let's take a look at this. Okay, so you can see what's happening here is the delay locator is automatically attaching itself here to this reflection. And let, we'll talk a little bit more later about why I know this is a reflection, but my first clue is that it's arriving later. And I can turn off this windowing here, this noise reduction, and that'll become more clear. Okay, so when I turn off all of the noise reduction, no windowing or anything, 
we just have the full signal here, you can see it a little bit more clearly here what's happening. And if you were using some software where you could not disable the noise reduction or the automatic delay locator, then you might not even notice this. Why? Because I'm going to turn on the uh, noise reduction here again, um, AKA the windowing. Uh, if you don't know what any of this stuff is, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm just trying to uh, show you what could go wrong if the delay locator uh, were locked on to the wrong peak. So you see here that we've, we're locked onto the wrong place. And so as soon as I turn on this noise reduction, um, it's going to diminish a lot of the sound that is not right where uh, this delay locator is. And ultimately that's a bad thing, right? Because we are getting rid of direct sound and we're keeping the reflection. And now we're gonna do our alignment to the reflection. So let me show you what I mean. So if I was working quickly and uh, didn't notice this, then this is what would happen. I would capture this signal that has way too much, uh, way too little high frequencies, way too much low frequencies, and I would now be aligning to a reflection. So now I would go and measure my subwoofer, and I would not realize that uh, my alignment was completely off because I had aligned to a reflection. So just these little things that can go wrong when you don't notice where your timing reference is, or if you're using a piece of software where um, it doesn't make it clear to you um, what's happening with that automatic positioning of the delay locator. I hope I'm being clear about that. A lot of these concepts are kind of new to me too, so I can show you what they look like, but I can't talk about them like an expert yet. Uh, so maybe we'll be bring back in Francisco in a little bit to, to say this a little bit more clearly after I finish up this demo. Um, so what do we want to do instead of this? Well, what I like to do in the field is so that I can just work quickly and not have to worry about any of this stuff is I'll typically just disable all of the windowing and noise reduction and automatic stuff. I'll just capture all of my data and then I'll figure it out later. Let me show you what I mean by that. So let's capture this. Uh, it'll still be captured with the reflection, but then we'll be able to do something about it later. So I'll call this main with reflection. And I'll go ahead and do a time sequence here. Let's make sure I have the right channel selected, and I do not. So main with reflection. Okay, so we still have this reflection in here. And if I went to do my uh, sort of noise reduction procedures here, and I had it automatically if I have Crosslight automatically pick where it wants to lock onto, it's still going to lock onto this reflection here. But now that I'm you know, doing the post-processing later um, and it's not automatic, now I can make a choice and I can say, hey, I think this reflection is, I think this is peak is actually a reflection. Why? Because it's arriving later and there's some other ways that I can verify this. But for now, if I know this is a reflection, instead of using that as my reference for this noise reduction procedure, what I can do is just remove that reflection. So I'm still at the exact same position, but instead of removing everything else, now I've reversed the process. So I'm removing the thing at the crossover, I'm sorry, at the cursor position there. So here in red is the original, and here in blue now, is without that reflection. And so I can just say, hey, 
Go ahead and make a copy of that. And now let's do our noise reduction procedure on this new one that does not have the reflection in it. And now the automatic you know, peak detection is working properly because I've removed that other larger peak. So I'll go ahead and apply and close and just show you the before and after. So this is the original. This is without that big reflection off the ground. And then this is the one where I did uh, more cleanup, right? More noise reduction. And this looks like a mess, right? And this looks really gross, but I have the microphone in the wrong position, right? All of this was just to show you sort of the options we have available here. And so I might have gone through all this procedure just to discover, oh, I have the microphone pointed at the ground or I have the wrong microphone selected or something like that. But going through this has sort of opened my eyes to what's going on here and has clued me into what's going on in the environment and my microphone position. Now, some of you might be looking at this and you might be thinking, well, this seems like a lot of extra work, but I just wanna remind you that I didn't have to do all of this. I did this so that I could verify it later and do some of the work later, but I could have all just, I could have left it all on automatic. So um, Francisco, I might bring you back in to see if you wanna say anything else about this. Um, so you're back in Francisco, do you wanna say anything about that procedure that I left out? Uh, you said already that it's really important to everyone understand uh, we have these tools to make better decisions. So uh, without applying noise reduction to remove the room or just to look to the room, uh, maybe it's really difficult to see just the system or to identify if we need to change something in room, something in microphone position or something in our system. So. Uh, that's why it's really important to have all these tools in automatic way or also manual. Okay, so uh, a defensive user will make better decisions and will uh, have better result from the system, from the room, from everything, applying all these tools se separately. Okay. Yeah, what you're saying is making me realize that um, I got really excited about Crosslight because there's so much about it that I feel like I can grow with into the future, right? And I like, because I like what you said about it having these advanced tools for advanced users. So you could basically leave on a lot of the automatic settings and that would be good for a beginner user, but then as you become more experienced and become an intermediate or advanced user, then you have more tools available to you. So you might wanna turn off some of those automatic settings and do more investigation into um, what's going on in the room or the, the system or the microphone position. Um, okay, anything else you wanna say before I take you out again, Francisco? No, it's okay. Great. Okay. But we started this by me telling you that we are going to do subalignment backwards. Now, how is that possible? Well, what I'm demonstrating for you here is that um, setting the time reference during the measurement process and then setting the time reference during um, the actual an analysis of the data are two different things, and they can be completely unlinked. And I'm gonna show that to you right now. So I'm gonna actually delete all of this data because I don't actually want to uh, use these measurements of the microphone on the floor. And then I need to turn the microphone back up to head height again. Okay, so I've got my microphone in place now and I'm gonna switch over to my sub channel and measure into there. 
And I hope this will be exciting for you if you have, up until today, always done measurements where you cannot set your delay locator with a subwoofer. Um, you've seen articles published by Bob McCarthy, Merlin Van Veen, and a lot of other people explaining why you cannot set a delay locator to a subwoofer. So I'm not, or to a bandpass driver. So I'm not going to repeat them all now, but um, it's true. You really can't, and there are a lot of important reasons for why you can't, but I'm going to show you today why you don't necessarily need that and how you can get around that in um, Crosslight. So I need to switch over my channels again. Just check to make sure that's working. Okay, and then I'll just call this sub. And this all looks good. So go. And there we go. We have a subwoofer measurement without ever having set a delay locator. Um, and this might be nice. First of all, if you are just ever just measuring a subwoofer by itself, right? So that can be sort of frustrating if all you want to do is measure one subwoofer or you're just doing a subwoofer array, but you're having trouble setting the delay locator. Um, so this is nice. We immediately see an impulse response here. We have our magnitude data here, and we can switch any of these graphs over to look at phase as well. And you can see it's pretty messy. You know, I didn't do any sort of uh, noise filtering or windowing, and I can always do that post-processing later here. So I'll go ahead and run my noise reduction process here. And as we talked about earlier, OK. Um, I always want to make sure that um, the automatic peak detection here is actually working properly. So I just like to zoom in here and make sure it's not picking up a reflection or something like that. OK, so here is the original measurement. And now here is the one where I've applied the noise reduction. And I can always switch them back and forth between them and go back to the original if I want to for some reason. And you can see I have a much cleaner phase graph down here and a much cleaner impulse response as well. So I've measured my subwoofer. And now let's go ahead and measure my full range speaker. And I got a message from Francisco. Um, oh, you want me to demo the other signal patterns as well. So uh, I think by signal patterns, Francisco, you mean uh, excitation signal. And if that's not true, then um, I'll bring you back in in a little bit and you can, and you can talk again. So um, there are a lot of different excitation signals here that we can choose from. So signal generator, not just pink noise, but we have a lot of different ones. And I'm not going to explain them all today. But I have found that the option of choosing these different signal choices here really helpful in the field. There are some of these like LogTurb3 and LogTurb DL2. I know these names probably don't make any sense to you. Um, but these can help us get really much higher uh, coherence, especially under difficult conditions, like being outdoors with lots of wind and noise, or being indoors with lots of reflections. So these can help with that. And so I could actually demo one of those here. So let's go ahead and use log chirp and I'll switch my outputs over. One thing that I really like about um, the log chirp is that it, I can have everything really much quieter. So with pink noise, I feel like I, I typically need about three, four, maybe five more dB of signal level here. But with the log chirp three, I feel like I need quite a bit less. 
Um, and it does sound weird and people always make jokes when I'm using it. Maybe you'll hear it in a second. I don't know if it'll come through the broadcast, but it's a lot faster. So people are like, oh, ha, 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 jokes, 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 and then it's over and it's silence. Okay, so now I'm gonna measure the main. Okay. So I've got my two speaker sources here. So let me go ahead and run my noise reduction on here. Always zooming in, make sure that cursor ended up in the right place. So here's before and here's after. And now I can go on and do my alignment procedure, um, however you like to do that. But this was just demonstrating that I'm able to have a flexible workflow because I'm not forced to start with any particular speaker just because of its bandpass elements, right? I can do the sub and then the main if I'm doing a multi driver box, I can do the mid driver, then the low frequency driver, then the high frequency driver, whatever I wanna do. So um, let me just check to see if there are any questions. And also Francisco, let me bring you back in for a second to see if there's anything that you wanted to say about that procedure we just demonstrated. Yes, just uh, I saw questions, uh, questions about this uh, excitation pattern. Signals. Uh, of course, with log chirps, uh, as you can see, we have better uh, signal to noise ratio. So it's easy to see in coherence trace, the coherence goes up. So we have uh, using long log chirps, we have better results uh, reducing signal, uh, increasing okay? signal to noise ratio. Uh, but of course, when we use this kind of signal, we are reaching a steady state. Okay, so I will try to be fast to explain this. So when we use the steady state uh, approach, okay, uh, avoiding uh, big dynamic changes, sometimes we we improve signal to, rate, to noise ratio, but maybe we don't see uh, problems related to uh, dynamic uh, response, okay? So uh, pink noise, we have uh, uh, an advantage because pink noise excites our system to show problems in dynamics, okay? So, that's why uh, we, it's so important to have different signals, okay? Uh, when you need signal to noise ratio, use log shift, but if you want to analyze if your system is really uh, have big quality according to dynamic control, this is not the best signal. So, for example, music or some kind of different signal with changes and we don't have a continuous, a constant uh, magnitude uh, in a sinusoidal pattern. We have something changing all the time, okay? So just this. All right, thanks Francisco. And yeah, and I feel like this speaker is actually a pretty good example of that because when we were playing the pink noise, it was pretty consistent pretty consistently bad in a way. And then when I switched to the log chirp and it was just playing a sine wave uh, at all the frequencies from top, from bottom to top, that's where you could see the coherence start to fall apart and it started to actually sound different because this high frequency driver is dying and you could hear it change. It would go like burr, 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 and like break apart a little bit. And here in uh, the coherence trace, you can see it sort of falling apart and having problems. 
Um, okay, great. Well, I'm going to take you out again, Francisco, and we're going to move on to the next thing. Okay. Now, we already looked at this. Um, so just to review, we saw how if there's a reflection that gets into our measurement and it's energetic and it's actually screwing up the response, we're able to flip the noise reduction procedure and actually re remove that single reflection without screwing up the measurement and basically move forward with our work. What about automatic alignment? Well, there are some pretty interesting um, automatic sort of auto, auto solver tools that we have here in Crosslight. And one of my favorite is optimize time and level. So if I turn on the sum trace right now, we can see that we're doing pretty well, but we could probably do better. Um, so what we have here in this black trace, this black trace is showing us what is the current summation between these two signals if we were to turn them on together. And then the dotted line is showing us what the maximum sum could be if they were perfectly aligned. And I want to take credit for this because uh, I was asking Francisco for this for a long time, uh, and then he added it a little while ago. So I feel like this is really important to be, for us to be able to see how well we're doing in relationship to what perfect alignment would be. Um, so I'm talking a lot, but this is actually just a one-step process where we can go up here, right-click in this impulse response, and choose optimize time and level. And you, and you see this and you think, well, this might, this didn't actually get better, so what's going on here? Well, if I switch over to the phase graph here and I turn off the sum trace for a second, it might be because we actually need a polarity inversion. And that's because um, Crosslight is doing its alignment here, but it's not doing the polarity inversion for us. So now when I turn this sum trace back on, you can see that we've regained a lot of this energy here. Another really nice thing about having this sort of auto solver tool that can work quickly is that we can also try a bunch of different variations. So I might look at this and I might see, hey, you know what? There's way too much overlap going on here. Really the main and the sub are both just overlapping. They're doing the same work here. Maybe we can make this relationship more efficient, give the subwoofer more custody of this low end region and put a high pass filter on the main. And so I can experiment with inserting filters here. And I'm gonna switch back over to the magnitude graph down here. And I can just play around with this filter and see if I can put it into some place. Maybe I say, hey, I like this relationship better. This is the kind of um, width of crossover region that I like. So then I turn the sum trace back on and then I can run that, <clears throat> excuse me, I can run that optimization routine again. And this time we probably don't need that polarity inversion anymore. Okay. So that's the auto solver. It's, it's, uh, it took less, a lot less time to explain this one than anything else, but it's so easy. Sometimes you just click on it and it works. There's a lot of other things you can do with this tool. Um, in terms of how the alignment works and, and how you can pre-process the signal before you do the alignment. Um, but this is one of my favorite tools to play with. Okay, so how do we create compensation files for our RF mics and why might we wanna do that? Well, let me go ahead and go grab my RF transmitter and I'll show you why. So, you know, RF systems out there range from good to bad and everything in between. And part of the reason is that there's always 
some kind of um, artifacts happening because of the wireless process, right? It's never going to be the same as just connecting an XLR cable. So I'm going to turn off the phantom power of this mic real quick. So the nice thing about this Electrosonics transmitter is that I can actually set the phantom power at different levels. So I've just turned it all the way off. And now I'm gonna take this microphone off and there it is, set at zero volts. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn the gain down. And well, maybe I'll show you what happens first and then I'll turn the gain down. So I'm going to take the output that I was sending to the speaker. So I'll unplug the speaker and I'm plugging the output from my audio interface into this transmitter. So then the RF signal will become the device under test basically, right? So now I'm sending signal directly out of the audio interface into the wireless transmitter. And then we're gonna just receive that. So let's make an extra channel to put this in. And we'll call this RF. Okay, so what you're gonna see here is that as soon as I turn this on, oh, I wanna go back to pink noise for now. As soon as I turn this on, you see that this input is slammed. And that's because, you know, line level is a lot different than microphone level. So I need to turn the gain down on this transmitter. So I'm gonna go into the gain setting and turn it from 40 down to zero. Okay. Okay. So now I'm just measuring the wireless system here. And what we can see is that we have some little bumps and dips. Um, most notably maybe is this down here. Now I can't remember if we can go down in frequency here. Looks like not right now. Okay, I can show you this later, but we have some kind of a high pass filter going on here. It's not completely flat, right? And this is actually adjustable in this transmitter. So I can go to the roll off and I can change it from 25 to 100. And if I reset the averages here, now that we see we have this and this is not a great situation for doing measurement because we'd like to be able to measure things down here, right? Especially our subs and low frequency drivers. Now, if you have a microphone that's like this, you can still do a lot of work up here and do a bunch of EQ and other kinds of alignment, but we can't do a lot of work down here. And so I just turned this up to sort of uh, show an extreme situation of this but there is a way for us to capture this and then create an offset file that will give us more actionable data in this area. So I'm gonna turn this back down to its lowest setting, which is 25 Hertz. And then I'm gonna turn off continuous. I'm gonna to choose to export it and store it in a channel. And one thing to know about Crosslight is that it has um, many channels that basically function as like a, a simulation of a DSP, a digital signal processor. Um, and that is one of the huge uh, pieces of power that we have in Crosslight is all of the simulation that it can do. Not only can it simulate um, just adding data together and showing us what it will look like if two things get summed together, get turned on together, but we can also do lots of things like adding IIR filters, creating FIR filters, and other stuff like that. So we're not gonna get into a lot of that today, but it's just good to understand that 
um, that is one of the big opportunities with Crosslight is um, this all this power we have for our off doing offline kind of processes, offline workflow. Okay, so let's measure this. And I always like to, you know, put some descriptive name that that is like the model number of the thing that I'm measuring. So this is uh, Electrosonics DPR dash A. So I would call this D. P R dash A, and I would also put the receiver in there, and the receiver is the DCR eight two two DCR eight two two. And I've already measured this before, so I'm also going to put today's date on here, and I will say timed, and then I'm going to store this in a Crosslight folder. Actually, no, I'll just put it in here because I've measured this a bunch already. So I'll store this in here. Uh, by the way, I, I probably set that signal too low. I'm just sort of moving quickly here. But you want to have the signal high enough that you're getting really good signal to noise ratio and taking, uh, taking advantage of all of the digital bits that you have available to you. Okay, so here's what I wanted to show you because I think here I can move this down and now you can see that maybe it doesn't matter that we can measure something all the way down to six hertz, but maybe I don't want this little roll off here, you know, below uh, 20 or 30 hertz. So what we can do is create a compensation file. So I'll just go to my interface settings here, go to calibration, choose the channel that I want to work with, and then I'll just load that measurement that I just took. I click Create. I see the measurement here in lots of detail. Notice that the y-axis here just goes from negative 4 to positive 2. So it's like super zoomed in, right? And now I can uh, invert that. So I'll invert the magnitude, and I will choose Phase Mode Flipped which will also move, remove any delay that it had from it or any um, you know, weird things in the phase response. And I feel like while you're doing this work, it's important to take a look at the impulse response. So we can zoom in here. And what I have found is that we can get a cleaner, we can get a better compromise between a compensated magnitude and phase response and a clean impulse response if we limit the amount of work that we're doing here. Why? Because right now, Crosslight is actually trying to compensate this file all the way down to you know, 1 hertz, right? And so uh, it's all the way down at like negative 40 dB at that point. And so it's going to create a compensation file to try to push for, you know, negative 40 dB all the way back up to zero. So that's a little bit crazy, a little bit unnecessary. So we can put some limits in here, and I can say, hey, instead of going down to 0 hertz, why don't you go down to 20 hertz? And instead of going all the way up to the Nyquist frequency, maybe we just need to go up to 20,000. And I find that that gives me a little bit cleaner impulse response here and just makes me feel like it, it makes a little bit more sense. And then once I've done that, I just click Apply and Close. And now when we go back into measuring this combo here again, I can enable that compensation file that I just created. So watch this magnitude response here. I will turn this on, and we see that it becomes perfectly flat. And let's take a look at the phase graph as well. So here's the phase graph that has a bunch of wraps because there's delay in there and then it gets all removed and also becomes perfectly flat once I enable this compensation file. So by using this file, I have effectively um, removed the RF system from my measurement as much as I can, you know, in between 20 and 20K. So let's take a measurement of this just so we can have a before and uh, uh, after experience here. Uh, go. Oh, right. Let's cancel. I don't actually need to save this file again. Go. OK. 
Okay, so here's the before image, and you can see that we've got you know this roll off here. Here's 20 hertz, and then when I switch over to the one we just took, now we're gonna see that it's flat all the way down to 20 hertz, and then it lets that roll off happen. And if I were looking at just a normal 20 to 20K graph, then it would just look flat, which is really nice. Okay, let me see if there are any questions about that. Oh, so Francisco says uh, there are actually 200 DSP channels to choose from. So very nice. OK, let's see what we have next here. OK, this is what I've been looking forward to. This is why I got this room that, so that we could work in. So let's have some fun here. Let me set my mic back up again. So right now, I still have it plugged into the audio interface. So I'll plug the output of the audio interface back into the speaker. I will take my transmitter, plug it back into my microphone. And got to hear it click. And then I need to undo the problem, the changes that I made earlier. So let's turn the gain back up to 40, where it was before. And I need to turn the phantom power back on. So I'm going to turn that up to 48 volts. And now, here's what I have. Maybe I can make this a little bit bigger. I have this megalodon. <laughs> so I have this remote controlled car. So what do you think is gonna happen when I take this remote controlled car and this microphone and attach them like this. Let's see what happens. All right, let me tilt this down so you can see me. All right, now this is not a remote control car that is designed to uh, hold a microphone. So I'm gonna just do the best I can with this gaff tape. Okay, now I need to turn it on. Now I don't need the stupid mic stand anymore. Now I need the remote control. Okay, now we can really do some good work. <laughs> so uh, here's what we're gonna do. So in Crosslight, um, there are various ways, we have a bunch of different tools, right? And there are various ways that we can um, use those tools and even break the rules. So let's break some rules. So let's go to our memories window where we were before. Let's get rid of all of this. I'm gonna open up the measurement window again. And we're gonna measure our main, measure our full range speaker, which we have done before. 
And one way that I could just capture a bunch of data um, really quickly is just to turn on the signal processor. I'm sorry, to turn on the uh, pink noise. And then I could just go up here and I could click store, 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 store while I move the microphone around. And that is probably the right way to do it. Um, but one tool that we can abuse here is this allow cumulative. And why do I say abuse? Well, this is not really what this tool is for. This is if you want to test like um, max SPL or uh, you want to just like, you know, measure a speaker over 30 minutes and take a measurement every minute. Well, you could use this tool, but I'm going to use it for our own process so that I can just force it to automatically store data for me. So I've got my car here set up. Let me just make sure I'm in a good, good spot. And let me make sure I have the right output selected. That all looks good. And let me sure that, make sure that you guys can actually see what I'm doing here. Looks OK. Maybe I'll turn this a little bit more this way. OK. And let's give this a shot. Okay, second position. Okay, third position. Okay. Fourth position. Capture that one again. Okay, fifth position. And one more position. Oh, shit. <laughs> I, I did a wheelie. Okay, so that was just kind of for fun so that you could, uh, so that I could drive a remote control around. Um, but you could actually do that. You know, you could start this up and then you could move the microphone around and uh, Crosslight would automatically capture all this stuff for you. And then what you could do is you could come back afterwards and see if there are any that you need to get rid of. So some of these, for example, um, this one in blue, you know, it looks like its impulse response is way out here. You know, this doesn't make sense. So this one I would probably want to delete, right? So let me see if I can actually go and find that one. Um, so let's see if it's this guy here. Oh, you know what I can do is I can just hide all of these and this just go through them quickly one by one. Hide all TF. Okay. This one looks OK. OK, so here's the one that looks like it got messed up because of something that I did. So I'll just hide it. That one's OK. Okay, just going through these. Uh, 
uh, and that's all of them. And so now what I can do is I can quickly just create an average. So we have all these different functions that we can apply here. Um, one of the easiest ones is just to get a quick decibel average here without worrying too much about the phase or doing any kind of alignment. So we do an average, close this out, and then I can now import that average into my channel here. Okay, and now I can apply uh, work on doing my EQ in quiet, in silence, without everyone hearing me do all my work. I can figure it out. Now, you guys know the best way to use an audio analyzer is by doing you know, comparisons. So uh, I need some kind of target to do my EQ against. So I'll load this target that I use a lot, and it looks like it needs to come up. And uh, you guys can see this is not, not a great speaker, but you know probably a, a good thing to practice EQ with, right? Okay, so let's say that that's good enough to get started, and now I can go through and practice putting some filters in here. And Crosslight actually has an auto solver to help us pick filters as well. And so I might say, hey, let me see if I can get a filter right here in this uh, mid-range area, maybe something that's about this wide. And then I say, hey, Crosslight, can you estimate the size of that filter for me? And it says, yes. And it puts that in. And, uh, and I say, hey, great, I like that. Maybe I make a tiny uh, adjustment here, adjust the gain, I adjust the EQ. And you can see I've got four tabs of IIR filters plus FIR filter here in the end. So in each of these tabs, there's five filters, so 5, 10, 15, 20, total of 20 possible filters here just on the channel itself. And then you can also apply filters um, on all channels at once, sort of like a global EQ. So I could keep going through here and applying filters until I found something that I liked. And then what I typically do in the field is then I copy and paste those into my output processor and then I just audition them and make sure that everything sounds good and I'm actually heading in the right direction. Um, okay, that was a lot of fun. I wish I could uh, let you guys drive the car around. Maybe we can do that in the future. Um, okay. So uh, let's see what's next. Uh, Giles says that I have to give away a Megalodon. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, so the last thing we're going to look at is the 3D spectrograph. And this is pretty simple, but I need the microphone to come back to me. So I guess I don't need to come to the microphone anymore. I can just get it to drive over to me. OK. What I'm going to do is, here's my beautiful uh, assistant, my beautiful measurement assistant. I'm going to uh, turn him off. You can go to sleep now, Megalodon. And I need to untape this contraption. So I've got my microphone, and I'm just going to set him uh, over here. Because what I want you to see is that when we open our acquisition window, we have a lot of things that we can look at. We can look at uh, transfer function, impulse response. There's a oscilloscope, a real-time analyzer. And there's also a spectrograph. And over in the spectrograph, we have some different options. So we have our normal RTA that you are familiar with. So I need to turn this on. We have a normal kind of um, RTA that you're familiar with, but, but the nice thing about this RTA is that it not only shows us um, you know, amplitude and frequency, but it also shows us dynamic range. So you can see this is the loudest frequency, 
and then it goes down to here. And so this is sort of a picture of the dynamic range of my current talking. So we can look at this in an RTA, we can look at this at a, you know, a two-dimensional spectrograph display that you're probably familiar with. And there we go, it's just being a little bit slow. There's a two-dimensional spectrograph that you're probably familiar with, but have you ever seen a 3D spectrograph? So cool. So now we have these three axes, right? We have amplitude, we have time, and we have frequency. And this allows me to spin this around in whatever orientation I like. So this can be a really quick way to get an idea of what has happened you know, over last certain amount of time period. We can see, oh, this part got loud and then this part got loud and we can see the dynamic range. But one really simple effective use of this tool is just showing, you know, uh, feedback frequencies and sine waves. So if I, if we were to hear a sine tone, then immediately we see that P come up here and Crosslight puts a little marker on it for us and it says, hey, at 1.3 kilohertz right now, you have this peak going on. And if we don't see that, it's also over here in the right. So just a nice, uh, fun tool to help us. And, and this is what I'm typically looking at during a show, right? So I'm either looking at this display or uh, I'll switch over and just look at the regular RTA regular old boring two-dimensional display. So that is the spectrograph. Those were all of the uh, basic demos that I wanted to do for you guys today. And so I haven't let Francisco talk in a while. So Francisco, we don't need to keep you here forever, but from the last demos that I just showed you, um, is there anything that you wanted to say about those that I didn't say enough of? Uh, oh, Nathan. For me, I think that, uh, of course, we have a lot of other things to say, uh, but um, uh, this is not the idea from this uh, live, okay? Uh, just a first approach, uh, intro, so I think that this was good for now. Thank you, sorry about that. Uh, okay, so I was just saying that we'll do a quick recap uh, and then we'll do the giveaway and then we will um, go through any questions you guys have. So we looked at how we can do subalignment backwards and uh, we don't have to do that, but you know the workflow is available to us if we need it. We can remove reflections from noisy measurements. We, can, we have these automatic alignment optimization routines uh, we looked at how we can compensate for our RF mics. Any, uh, any weird stuff because of those. Um, we took a bunch of measurements with the Megalodon and looked at how we could quickly create an average and then apply filters. And we looked at the 3D spectrograph. So um, here is the pitch that I have for you guys about this course that I'm putting together. So today we just saw a quick demo, right, of some of the really amazing things that are possible with Crosslight. And I would like to put together something more comprehensive for you, something that I'm calling um, Crosslight Modern Calibration Procedures. And here's what I think is that we've just kind of started the discussion today, right? But there are probably a lot of questions you have in your mind. Like when you look at this, you see that there are many, many options we have available to us. And so you're probably wondering, of the 1,000 options that we have in Crosslight, what's the most important things I need to know? Um, what are some of the most efficient ways to capture data in the field without blasting pink noise all day long? How can Crosslight teach me to use filters? 
Um, and then how do I apply EQ filters really accurately now that we have this simulation technology? Um, and how do I you know, do crossover alignment in Crosslight? There, we saw some ways of doing that today, but what's the best way to do it at, and how do I apply that to my particular scenario? So I'm putting together this workshop. It's going to have three lessons over three weeks. And you guys know how I like to do my workshops. I typically do like a 60 to 90 minute lesson. And then there's some homework during the week. And then at each lesson, we talk about um, what happened. And we, we answer any questions. And I have here dates to be determined. Why? Because uh, I haven't scheduled this yet. What I want to see is if you want this to happen and you sign up for this today, and then uh, you know over the next two weeks, if we can get at least 10 people to sign up, then we'll do it. You know, it, this is something brand new. It's always hard for me to tell how much interest there's going to be. So if there's interest and 10 people sign up for it, then we'll do it. If there's not, no big deal. Uh, we can just keep doing sort of informal workshops occasionally like this. So if you're interested in this, here are the lessons that I have put, that I'm thinking about putting together. Um, we're going to talk in, we're going to talk about learning filters and building alignment presets. We're going to look at gathering actionable data. And then in the last lesson, talk about doing EQ and how powerful uh, that is to be able to just simulate those filters in Crosslight. Of course, uh, the course will come with a, you know, some extra stuff like it'll have a private training with me so that we can make sure that you're getting Crosslight set up properly and getting everything out of it and everything's working for you. And we'll have lots of demos and tips and tricks in there. Um, so this is the bundle that I am putting together with the support of Francisco Montaido. Normally, Crosslight is $500. And normally, this workshop would be $100. But we are combining our forces and putting this together to offer both of them together to you for one price. So for $500, you can get the software and the training packaged together. And I'm also offering some financing for this. If you don't want to pay immediately $500 for this whole thing, you could do six monthly payments of $96 each. Um, by the way, I should point out that this is not for French people. There's probably not a lot of French nationals watching. But if there are any French people watching, if you're interested in Crosslight, there is someone uh, named Deary who you should reach out to at a company called Audio Tech. And that is who does sales of Crosslight in France. So French people, please reach out to Deary. Deary, if you're here, maybe you could put your contact into the chat right now. But here's what's going to happen. Um, I'm going to put this link. Oh, sorry, it's asking me to log in. But let me just grab this link. Got to scroll down to the bottom of my notes here. OK, so I'm going to put this into the chat right now. And this link is where you go to purchase this bundle. So if you purchase this, then um, Francisco is going to give you a code for the software, and then you'll sign up for the workshop. And then you and I will figure out exactly when and how that workshop is going to take place. Um, but it'll be sometime in the next two to three weeks, depending on how many people we get to sign up today. Um, what else should I say about this before we go? Um, I'm really excited about this software. I've never done a training that is just on one piece of hardware or one piece of software, but you guys know how much I enjoy talking about alignment and audio analyzers. So this is really right up my alley to be teaching this kind of stuff and be you know, supporting its development. Um, if you open that link and it asks you to log in, that's because you have to create an account on my platform before you can purchase anything. And it's, it's just a little hoop you have to jump through, and it's a little bit annoying. But um, if you've already bought a course from me in the past, then you'll already have the login information. OK, so that's probably enough for me pitching you uh, doing sales about this thing. Um, I hope it's interesting for you. And like I said, if we can get about 10 people to sign up over the next two weeks, 
then I'll make sure that this course happens. So if you're interested in this and you're going to sign up, you might want to ask a couple of your friends to sign up as well so we can make sure that it happens. Um, OK. So that was that. Let's move on to the next thing. So let's do the giveaway. So hopefully all of you have entered the giveaway. And I'm going to do that drawing now. So. Uh, get ready to type into the chat, because if I say your name, I want to see you in the chat. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to another name. So I'll give each name about 30 seconds, I guess. OK, so let me draw the first winner. The first winner is Martin. Last name starts with a P. The email address is martin.p. I don't want to say your whole name, but if your email address is martin.p and the last name starts with PR, then please type hello or yes or I won into the chat right now, because if you don't, we'll need to go on to another person. So I'll type into the chat. The email address is martin, martin PR and then a bunch of other characters at gmail.com. So, Martin, if you're here with us today, please say something. Martin, you're here. OK, fantastic. We have a winner. So Martin, um, you are the lucky winner of one complete uh, license to Crosslight. And so I'll need to put you in contact with Francisco. So um, Martin, please send me an email after this. And I'll also try and reach out to you. So congratulations. And I'm so glad you were here. Uh, actually, let me mark that real quick. Um, name Martin. Confirm. All right, Martin, you should get an email about this. I'm clicking notify right now. Close. OK, any questions? I have been sort of ignoring the chat. And so let me just scroll back. I want to see, are there any questions about Crosslight, questions about um, this new workshop that I'm offering, or any questions that you might have for Francisco? So I'm going to put Francisco back in, see if there's anything he wants to say. Um, and I'm going to scroll back through and see if there are any questions in the chat I need to ask. For me, it's OK, Nathan. Uh, just wait. We have some other questions, but uh, I think that it was a very good first approach, and I hope we have some new participants in your training. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Geraldo asks, uh, the software is Windows only? Yes. So I'm on a Mac right now, but I'm running it in parallels, and I haven't had any problems. So I basically take one computer with me to work, and it's a MacBook Pro. And then I use Parallels to run any software that I need to run in Windows. Um, but you know, forward thinking, if lots of people get really interested in Crosslight moving forward, and we get lots of Crosslight users, I'm sure we can convince Francisco to work on a Macintosh version someday. OK, I'm just scrolling back to see if there's any other questions I need to ask, answer. OK, so this is a really important question, right? And this is one of the very first questions that I asked as well, because I've showed you guys how we can insert these filters. And so you're wondering, aren't our filters always the same? Are they different from manufacturer to manufacturer? And I'll let um, Francisco talk as well. but. 
one of the things that makes Crosslight so accurate is that Francisco has done his own research to make the filters that are simulated in Crosslight be as cross compatible as possible, right? And my experience in using them in the field is that I do my simulations in Crosslight with the EQ filters. I insert those exact filters in my DSP and nine times out of 10, they come out exactly how Crosslight said they would. But if you ever wanna verify that, you can always do your filters in Crosslight and then just measure your DSP and see if they're different. And that would be a quick way to see if they're different. But Francesco, do you wanna say anything about EQ translating from manufacturer to manufacturer? Yes, uh, please, I think could you just press one, one IIR tab there just to show all filters we have or all options, the list. Yes. So we have all these options. So for example, parametric, we have three different because sometimes the first one will be to your ESP, maybe another model, the, the first or the second. So you just need to uh, apply one filter in your DSP, uh, Nizer, okay, here inside Crosslight, and then just repeat your filter inside Prose light and look which one fits perfectly over the electric trace to be your measurement. So it's really easy. You measure and then you uh, already know which is uh, the best to your processor. Thank you, Francesco. I just want to show that again and show that again. <laughs> okay, just some nice things here, and then I'll go back to the bottom. Let's see, I think we talked about most of this earlier. Okay, let me scroll back to the bottom, see if there are any other questions. Cool. Great. Uh, oh yeah, Bliss says, is it also available for Mac? No, not yet. So that's why I'm using Parallels. You can probably also use something like Wine or something like that. Um, anyway, thank you guys for being with, he with us here today. If you have any other questions, please email me, Nathan at sounddesignlab.com. If you're watching this recording later, then um, please just comment on the video and I will check on the comments occasionally. Let me know what questions you have about Crosslight, sound system calibration in general, um, or this new workshop that I'm putting together. But otherwise, um, Francisco, thank you again for being here. Um, thanks everyone uh, who participated. And let me just close this so we don't end on this double click. I'm not gonna be able to make it go away. That's okay. Uh, thank you guys for being here. This was a lot of fun for me. And um, if you want me to do more stuff like this in the future, please just let me know. All right. Thanks, everybody.